before we start recording. So welcome all to the department colloquium uh, today. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Golipur from uh, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Alberta. Professor Golipur is one of the world leaders on using metal chalcogenite systems as a sort of phase change materials to have repro repro <laughs> reprogrammable circuits. Uh, which is a very hot field currently with a, with a lot of very exciting applications that I'm guessing and hoping that we'll get to hear about over the next 45 minutes or so. So please take it away. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nir. And um, uh, also thank you very much, uh, 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 Professor Shastri, for your kind invitation. I see you there on the screen there. Um, so um, as, um, as Professor Rottenberg just um, uh, alluded to, um, I'm going to give you all a, a, a bit of an overview on uh, some of the activities that we've been doing um, over the last couple of years in, um, in the sort of realm of uh, metal chalcogenite nanophotonics. Um, I'm Barrett Golipur, and uh, the lab that I'm coming from is the Nanoscale Optics Lab at the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at the University of Alberta. So, so some of the things that we do um, in my lab are um, things uh, such as sort of, uh, it, we, we develop a variety of different devices and uh, manufacturing methods and processes um, uh, that have uh, a variety of different applications. But the main sort of markets that we uh, target here at the Nanoscale Optics Lab at the University of Alberta are things like laser-based manufacturing, photovoltaics and thermoelectrics. Generally, we have a, a big interest in trying to improve and enhance the efficiency of energy devices and energy-related energy devices. Um, we've got a huge interest in, in trying to make nanophotonic devices for display technologies, telecommunication centers and sort of uh, data centers, photonic computing. And you can see that the sort of the three of these are, are an am amalgamation of trying to control signal intensity and phase um, and color effectively uh, across various parts of the um, uh, spectrum from sort of UV side all the way to the infrared side covering and the entire telecom band and beyond that as well. And in the context of sensing, we do a lot of work on, uh, on uh, nanoscale sensing of various uh, different species. In particular, the, one of the big, the big project that we, we're, we're working on right now is trying to sort of use um, uh, fiber integrated metasurfaces for uh, a variety of gas and sort of uh, hydrocarbon sensing um, applications. Uh, I won't be covering all of these uh, different activities here, but I'm very happy to discuss all of these offline. I'm going to give you as, as um, um, it was alluded to, I'm going to give you a, a big overview on, on most of the phase change related activities that we're doing. We're quite well known for that. And I think um, it, it would be of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of interest to everyone here. I'm also going to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the um, uh, capabilities that we've developed over in my lab um, in the context of sort of well, within the umbrella of this sort of Alberta metal chalcogenite ma manufacturing facility that we have um, in order to hopefully see some, uh, some uh, collaborations and other things at the, uh, towards the end of the talk. So, with all of this in mind, um, um, we're going to cover the, the following sort of topics. Um, with a view to optical telecommunication and emerging computing applications, we're going to discuss nanophotonic phase change materials. And one of the things that uh, we do within my group is we don't just take a particular material and use it uh, for, a device, for a particular device. We try and actually control the, um, uh, the optical and electronic properties of these, um, uh, these materials, first on an atomic level. We tune the, their stoichiometry, we tune their composition to try and really have designer materials for designer applications. Once we've managed to uh, optimize our material system, our material uh, base, our material platform, we go on and we try and uh, integrate them and we design various different geometries, various different configurations and architectures for, uh, for us to be able to integrate these uh, charcogenite, uh, metal charcogenite uh, semiconductors within major most of the time where we're looking at metal materials and metal surfaces. Um, as it's a very tunable platform, I'm going to touch upon um, uh, some of the basics on that um, as we go through. Um, and we're trying to sort of, uh, our main aim is always to try and create some sort of reconfigurable, some sort of adaptive uh, device in the free space um, and also in the optical fiber integrated and wavelength integrated sort of uh, regime when we're trying to think about integrating these devices and materials with modulators, attenuators, and uh, in the broader context, trying to integrate them with well, what is already out there in telecommunication networks. 
Um, towards the end of the talk, um, um, I, I was going to talk about graded in some of the graded index work that we have, but we uh, recently just published on, on some, of, some of the alternative mechanisms to phase change that we can also use in these semiconductors. And I thought, well, given the, the fact that this field is currently a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bit of a sort of a um, hot period, um, it's nice to sort of talk a little bit about what's beyond phase change. If there is life beyond phase change, is there something we can do that would improve some of the um, uh, problems or, or should we say some of the uh, bottlenecks that we have in devices currently? Okay, so with that, um, let me uh, dive into uh, the world of nanophotonics in the context of really uh, metal charcogenides and metal surfaces and metal materials. So nanophotonics in this, in this realm really started off uh, life, um, as, as many of you know, this is an expert audience that I'm, I'm, I'm talking to here. Um, it started life in the, in the normal noble metals and the golds, the silvers, the coppers. We were really just playing with plasmonics over a decade ago, uh, just over a decade ago. Um, and the majority of our devices relied on the plasmonic properties of these noble metals. However, since then, we've really moved off, um, mainly initially because of the ohmic losses that these metals have in the UV and sort of high energy visible parts, parts of the spectrum. Uh, people started to look at alternative methods. Aside from that, also we've had considerations on cost and other things and fabrication and many other things. Um, and people started to look beyond the noble metals. So people have really sort of uh, gone way beyond them now. And uh, many, many different device platforms have been shown in things like oxide glasses, refractory metals like Thai nitride, TCOs, transparent conductive oxides, polymers, silicon, superconductors, gallium arsenide, 2D materials from graphene, all the way to the uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, as well as perovskites. Um, my group and my, 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 the, my activities over the last decade have really concentrated on the charcogenide uh, semiconductors. And we've really tried to sort of uh, um, um, make the world aware of their, 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 their uh, flexible properties, their, the variety of different properties that they have. Um, they are a fantastic platform for nanophotonics. And, and, one of the uh, and there are many reasons for this. So for the uninitiated, for those not familiar with charcoal semiconductors, uh, let me put all of these up on the screen. Um, they are compounds of heavier group 16 elements, um, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, um, and they have compositionally tunable properties. This is a, this is a major advantage of these uh, materials. As we tune their composition, as I'm gonna show you in a couple of slides time, um, we can really adjust their optical properties, their electronic properties, anything from permittivity, refractive index, extinction coefficient, to conductivities and resistivities, and anything related to most of the device platforms that we make in the telecom and computing realm. Um, they have very high optical nonlinearity. So here I show you the nonlinear refractive index um, of, uh, of a variety of different glasses and semiconductors used in the world of optics. And, um, and you can see the fact that most of the silica glasses, the oxide glasses are down here, whereas the charcoal glasses have very high nonlinear refractive indices, much higher than the traditional glasses. So they're, they're very akin to being used in sort of nonlinear optics applications. Aside from that, they have this very wide transmission window. Again, I show you a, a, a simple comparison between some oxide glasses, commonly used in optical fibers, um, um, and sulfide, selenides, and tellurides. And you can see the, the, the charcoal glasses have very wide transmission windows, way beyond anything that's uh, available to us in the oxide realm. Um, so really this, this, this IR transparency and optical nonlinearity was the reason why since the 60s and 70s, a large number of different people started to look into these material systems. And that, that was the major motivator there, the, the IR transparency, optical nonlinearity being high. And then it comes, uh, along comes uh, uh, Stanford Ovshinsky around the, in the, in the sort of late 60s, uh, 68, I believe. And um, he starts to push the phase change functionality that these materials have. Um, so uh, charcoal semiconductors, a large number of them have this non-volatile, um, optically or electrically induced amorphous to crystalline transition, excuse me, uh, amorphous to crystalline transition. This has meant that they've been used for decades now in, in CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays. When you, when you talk about storing information in your CD, DVD, and Blu-ray, you're storing it in the phase of the charcoal semiconductor. And more recently, the likes of IBM, Samsung, and Intel have started to um, integrate these into um, electronic phase change memory, uh, PC RAM, um, which is, uh, which is uh, being touted as a, as a replacement to flash memory, um, as it's a fast, low-power, non-volatile sort of uh, um, uh, transition mechanism. 
Um, and one of the really unique things about these semiconductors, which I don't know of many other materials that have this particular um, uh, flexibility, is that they, they're available in many different chemical and geometrical forms. You can grow them as nanowires, nanoparticles, monolayers, as I said, they're, they're being touted as alternatives to graphing in the forms of TMDCs, optical fibers, topological insulators are mainly based on the charcogenized semiconductor systems, uh, various types of bismuth-based bismuth uh, uh, tellurides and selenides are being used in that realm, 2D materials again, or just uh, another mon monolayers, and there's also superconductors as well. So not many materials can be drawn as optical fibers, grown as nanowires, and also grown as thin films in such a flexible manner. Um, so with all of this in mind, all of this uh, uh, beautiful potential and promising um, uh, uh, sort of set of attributes that we could possibly use for our devices, with all of this in mind, um, we've been concentrating for a number of years on the phase change functionality. So phase change is a very, very interesting process. Um, it's, it's a transition between the different crystal structures that you have in a particular char metal charcoal semiconductor. Um, you can transition between a crystalline and an amorphous phase in a reversible manner. Um, and you do this through a melt quench process when you're going from a crystalline to an amorphous phase. In the crystalline phase, you have long range order in your lattice, therefore it's crystalline. You will melt this material very momentarily and quench it very quickly. And I always try to make the sort of analogy to people that if you've ever seen a traditional sort of uh, glass blowing, wine, wine glasses that the people are trying to make in these sort of, that people have been making for hundreds of years, once they've blown the glass, they put it into cold water very quickly, right? To quench it uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the shape that they've blown it into. We're doing the same thing with optics here. We're doing the same thing with optics and elect uh, electricity in the form of um, um, the PC RAM devices that I mentioned. Um, so we melt and quench with, uh, uh, with an optical pulse generally, uh, or an electrical pulse, uh, to an amorphous phase, which has short to medium range order. And we can do this again by annealing this. We can crystallize it and then melt quench it back and forth again. And we can do this millions of times. Um, and this has been the basis for, as I said, uh, CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, and PC RAM. Now, if we're trying to use these as optical and electronic sort of uh, devices for optical and electronic readout and encoding of the information, um, let's take a moment and just understand what the different um, uh, phases entail. In the amorphous phase, we've got low reflectivity, so high levels of transmission through our device. The extinction coefficient is low. Um, and high resistivity, right? We have uh, no long range order. We've got a lot of electron scattering in these devices. So we've got a lot of high, uh, we've got a high resistivity in these, uh, in these particular materials in the amorphous phase. We switch it over to the crystalline phase and we've got a huge change in our uh, reflectivity. So now in the crystalline phase, we've got high reflectivity, low levels of transmission um, relative to the amorphous phase. And, um, and the, what, where we had high resistivity in the amorphous phase, now that we have a nice arranged crystal structure, we've got a nice conductivity on our um, film as well. So the resistance drops dramatically. So you can see why um, this change in resistance has been the basis for PC RAM devices and how this change in reflection, transmission and absorption can be the basis for a large number of different nanophotonic devices that we can actually try and uh, fabricate, design, create, um, what have you. So. Now that I've hopefully convinced you that there is something here worth paying attention to, um, let's concentrate a little bit more on, on the very nature of the phase change. Let's start talking a little bit more on the alloys and the, the materials that we have. Uh, I'm going to talk quite a bit about this particular alloy, germanium antimony telluride 225. This has been a very traditionally used alloy across a, a large number of devices uh, historically. There's a number of different alloys that have um, uh, that are being introduced every every day really nowadays. People are looking for uh, better materials. And when I say better, I mean better optical properties, lower extinction coefficients, higher refractive indices, bigger um, uh, uh, deltas and uh, sort of higher modulation contrast and so on and so forth. Um, so in the case of GSD, I'm showing you here the real and imaginary part of the permittivity, epsilon one and epsilon two, across 200 nanometer to 1700 nanometer wavelength. So covering the UV side of the uh, spectrum across all of the visible, the telecom band. So where most of, most of our activities on this planet as humans lies, right? Most of the optical devices that we make are across this particular band. Um, so the phase transition entails a change in the real part of the permittivity, as you can see in the solid lines here. The amorphous to crystalline change uh, creates a major change in our dispersion. 
Also, it creates a huge change in our epsilon two, um, our imaginary part of the permittivity. Um, and we go from a uh, what's a, a plasmonic um, material in the UV visible part of the spectrum to a non-plasmonic material when we switch between a crystalline and amorphous phase. So what does that imply? That implies that we have a material system here that can switch between a metal and a glass, a metal and a dielectric across visible frequencies in a non-volatile manner. Um, I don't know any other material that can do this, to switch between a metal and a glass, as far as optics is concerned, across visible wavelengths. Vanadium oxide can do similar things in the infrared, but not across visible wavelengths. And as I'm going to show you, we can really tune this particular window very, very widely. Um, so some of the things to just remind everyone, um, they are reversible in this transition. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is a non-volatile transition. So once we switch the material, if the, if the electricity or the light, the laser light is taken away, um, the, the state of the material stays in, its, in the state that you left it in, right? It's non-volatile. We do not need to pump these devices constantly to keep them at, at a particular elevated state. We only put power in to tr create a transition. Once the transitions happen, it will stay in that phase until you come in and you switch it again. So this is a major, major reduction in our power consumption, just from a very, very simple sort of um, uh, uh, sort of uh, book cover looking at looking at it at that sort of level. Um, the, so they're non-volatile, very fast switching times. Um, many people have uh, demonstrated a large number of different sort of switching regimes, depending on the device structure, the thickness of the device, how confined it is, what alloy it is, so on and so forth. We ourselves have demonstrated switching down to uh, 85 femtosecond pulses. We can be switched this electrically or optically, as I said. You can create very broadband changes, as you can, as you can see in the optical uh, properties. And because of the fact that they've been deposited through uh, for CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays for many years, and PC RAM more recently, this is a very CMOS-friendly material system. The, these materials, you're not going to go to a foundry and have them run away, because there are foundries on, on this planet that have been doing these things for decades. Um, aside from that, the major companies, the major players, all have an interest and have foundries, have parts of their foundries already dedicated to making some of these alloys. Not the newer ones, but the, the willingness is there. So that is also a major, major consideration to be made. And as I said, this plasmonic to dielectric transition is a very unique um, uh, transition that we can use for a variety of different things. Um, we ourselves have used it for display technologies, and I can, I'll can i show you some of, that, some of that stuff as well. Okay, um, so we've got this very, very nice um, dispersion. And as I said, um, there is an extra, there's, a, there's an extra um, uh, kicker to this, right? Um, in that we can tune all of this dispersion in these material systems. We're not stuck with whatever we started with. It's not a case of a, a gold or a silver or, or a copper. That's a single element um, a material. We cannot tune it. Whatever nature has given us, we're stuck with it. Okay. In the case of the chalcogenides, because of the number of different alloys involved in a particular, a number of different elements involved in a particular alloy, we can really move these uh, compositions around and look at how our optical and electronic properties changes. So with that, we've really um, um, uh, done a lot of work on stoichiometric engineering of these alloys. And I'll explain what stoichiometric engineering means. So <clears throat> we're trying to get designer optical properties um, uh, where we can basically tune the optical properties of the material to the exact application that we need. You tell me, I need this particular refractive index, this particular extinction coefficient at this wavelength. And I, will, and I need it in this particular material system, right? We can go and tune this, move it around and, and tell you exactly um, which alloy, which composition can give you the exact indices that you need. Aside from that, we can actually understand and identify new areas of um, uh, um, ap new applications and new research directions through doing this sort of um, rapid screening. So let me tell you a little about how we do that. We rapidly screen the optical, electri electrical, mechanical, and phase change and other properties of uh, various alloys um, uh, in uh, uh, using the stoichiometric engineering technique. So. Let's take a, a fictional alloy, ABC. Um, we, we will put each of the constituent elements in, in different sources in a typical PVD chamber. So they, these can be E-beam uh, sources, plasma sources, you know, K-cells, um, so thermal evaporation sources. And by putting a wedge between your source and your sample, you can create partial shadows um, between your uh, source and your sample, which translates to a thickness gradient uh, from each of these sources um, being deposited on your sample. 
Um, once you co-deposit all three of these different elements, in the case of this fictional ABC alloy, you can get a particular sample, one single sample that at every single different direct, um, position is a slightly different composition of the alloy you um, started off with, right? So instead of going out making 100 samples to be able to test 100 compositions, we can make one sample to test 100 compositions. So as an example for uh, the, the GST alloy that I, that I um, uh, uh, hinted at, the germanium antimony telluride 225 alloy, took almost over a decade to um, optimize to a particular composition. Um, uh, and it's, people continue to move around the composition to look for interesting properties. You, you could have done this in a matter of only a couple of months with this, uh, with this particular uh, technique if you've got everything set up in a matter of weeks. And this is a very widely sort of flexible technique. You can do this with a lot of different uh, oxides, carbides, nitrides, and uh, a variety of other things. So let me take the sample for you and let's have a look at the optical properties of this. Let's do some variable angle spectroscopic ellipsometry to understand what the real imaginary part of the permittivity looks like across different wavelengths at each of these different positions. So here I show you um, a, a video and here we've got a, a binary alloy and too many telluride. And we're just cycling wavelength uh, from UV all the way across the telecom band. And you can see that we have areas where we have negative epsilon one. This is the real and imaginary part of the permittivity. So we have areas where we have negative epsilon one. We have areas where we have very high epsilon one. We have areas where we have low uh, epsilon two, high epsilon two. So we can identify um, alloys at dif different wavelengths that are plasmonic. Alloys at different wavelengths that have very high refractive indices. So are great for dielectric photonics, waveguides, and metasurfaces that are based on knee resonances. Um, uh, and at the same time, we can monitor their extinction coefficients. So we can pinpoint exactly where you would find your magic material that's going to give you that extra gain. And this is even before we've managed to sort of, we had a look at trying to um, uh, nanostructure or create some sort of device geometry and configuration that will give us enhancement or some sort of gain in our device platform. Um, so I show you this on a, on a, uh, a, for a binary alloy and we're cycling wavelength. Let me put the wave, uh, wavelength, instead of cycling it in time, let me put it for you on the uh, x-axis um, of, a, of a graph and show you the real part of permittivity. And instead of just showing you one antimony telluride, let me show you a uh, four different alloys in the metal chalcogenide uh, greater family. So bismuth telluride, germanium antimony telluride, bismuth antimony telluride, these are all alloys of interest. BSD is being pursued by people for topological insulators. GSD is a phase change, famous phase change alloy. Bismuth telluride uh, has been used traditionally in the thermoelectric devices for a large number of years, long num uh, many years, um, and also being used for TI applications. Antimony telluride, again, is a phase change and also a TI um, device, um, a material system as well. You can see here that all of them have a very similar dispersion. The real part of permittivity um, across wavelength, um, they all swing down into a negative epsilon regime, um, so or plasmonic, and also swing back up into a high index dielectric regime, um, uh, where they have very high refractive indices across the, most of the telecom bands. So they can really hold very good optical modes across this wavelength, these wavelengths. Um, given that their refractive, uh, their extinction coefficients drop in the infrared. The other thing that you'll notice is we have two epsilon one equals zero points, one which doesn't seem to move uh, across different alloys, and the other one seems to be very susceptible to being moved by changing the composition. Um, and by definition, this means that we can really shift this plasmonic band back and forth. If that second epsilon one zero point can move and the first one doesn't, we can really uh, change and tune our plasmonic bandwidth very, very um, um, uh, in a very controlled way by just controlling composition. So let me now put this um, uh, across one alloy and show you how we, by changing composition of antimony telluride, we can tune this plasmonic bandwidth. So here I show you the binary alloy again, antimony telluride, and I show you the different compositions of this alloy uh, by changing the tellurium from 92% to 11%, which obviously correspondingly is going to change the antimony in, the, in, in, the, in this composition as well, right? In the antimony tellurium. As we change the tellurium, you can see that we can shift and tune the plasmonic bandwidth of this material system from 
only uh, the, across the UV visible part of the spectrum, all the way covering uh, the telecom band. So we can suddenly have a, the same material system is now um, uh, plasmonic across a much wider band. We can use plasmonic properties at uh, close to telecom band um, and, a, and a phase change alloy. Um, and correspondingly, this, this also uh, ch changes uh, the extinction coefficient, uh, epsilon two, um, uh, sorry, the, the imaginary part of permittivity um, um, because of uh, kramers conic relations and causality, of course, yeah. Um, now, let me move off and go from a binary alloy to a um, ternary alloy. And let's, let me just demonstrate to you how we can identify alloys for specific optical applications um, related to dielectric and plasmonic devices. So in dielectric devices, we're generally dealing with displacement currents and high index dielectrics like silicon, perovskites, and the charcogenites. Whereas in the plasmonic devices, we're generally dealing with conduction currents. So the, well, that's why we sort of look at the negative epsilon um, and, and materials like gold, silver, and aluminum, as you know. So here, I'm showing you now the tuning of optical properties for a ternary alloy, bismuth, antimony, telluride, BST. And you can see that these are um, ternary plots. If you're not familiar with them, each of the, the tellurium, the bismuth, and the antimony uh, are dropped on each side of this, this particular triangle. Uh, so by plotting the um, different parameters related to our devices, we can um, understand which compositions are, are best for our different applications. So we can, for example, look at the refractive index at 1550 for telecom band. And you can see here that we have very high refractive indices in the ternary uh, parts of the composition. Um, whereas if we're looking at, for example, N over 4 pi K as a metric for dielectric photonics. So if you're trying to hold a mold in a, in a, in a simple dielectric sphere, you want the refractive index to be quite high and, um, and you want your extinction co coefficient to be as low as possible to put it very crudely. Right? So this is a, a, as a metric for us identifying what alloys are good for these sort of uh, devices. You can see that most of the, uh, this particular metric is very, very strong uh, close to the axes, which means that the binary alloys are actually much better for these applications. Um, correspondingly for the plasmonic thing, uh, plasmonic materials, we can tune the bandwidth, as I, as I said, and we can go um, from, uh, in the binary case, very uh, small bandwidths on our plasmonic regi uh, region. Um, to in the ternary case, um, having very, very large bandwidths. Um, so our plasmonic uh, bandwidth is much, much larger here, so we can identify those. And we also look at things like losses at, at epsilon near zero points. Um, if you're familiar with epsilon near zero photonics, um, there's a huge amount of potential there, um, but the, the majority of the um, real world manifestations of ENZ relies on extremely low optical losses um, uh, for, the, for these things to be manifested. So we, we're also always looking in that context for low loss epsilon near zero points. And just to sort of wrap up this section um, and um, uh, put things in context a little bit for, for all of you, um, if we plot the plasmonic figures of merit and a dielectric figure of merit here, um, uh, uh, in relation to other typical material systems that people are using in, in nanophotonics, silver, uh, gold, um, things like tie nitride, the refractories, uh, TCLs, transparent conductive oxides, you can see that in the plasmonic case, um, the charcogenite family actually um, uh, surpasses the gold and silvers and the UV visible, the UV part, part of the spectrum. So we actually end up having better properties, better plasmonic properties at these sort of wavelengths, beating the golds and the silvers. Um, corresponding, if you look at the dielectric figures of merit, as the TCOs, TCOs drop in there um, and how well they can hold a particular mold as we go further and further in the, <clears throat> in the infrared, um, the BSD starts to gain further and further. So the BSDs can start to become much more of a better platform as the TCOs really drop further and further into the um, um, uh, uh, sort of 1550 and sort of uh, further infrared bands are related to tel telecom and sensing and other things um, beyond, the fi um, uh, beyond the sort of uh, telecom. Band. Okay, um, so what I've demonstrated to you hopefully here uh, by this point is the fact that we can tune on an atomic level, most of the optoelectronic properties of these uh, materials. Now, once we have this material system that is perfect for our particular application that we've tuned and we are happy with, we can now start to think about integrating them within various devices. And as I said, our bread and butter, what we're interested in generally making and uh, uh, as, as, as the core of our devices is a metamaterial metasurface. 
Um, so metamaterials and metasurfaces, uh, for those not familiar with them, allow us to engineer novel and exotic macroscopic optical properties by structuring and combining materials. Metals and dielectrics at sub wavelengths, uh, given the wavelengths that we work at, means nanoscale. Um, um, and, and really we're working with trying to nanostructure these materials and working with the effect and the sort of um, uh, effective medium regime where we're dealing with sort of um, uh, structures that have much smaller resonate uh, single metamolecule sizes than the wavelength of operation. And this has been a very hot field as many of you uh, very well know. Uh, in the last decade or two, this has really picked up and people have demonstrated a large, large number of different uh, um, uh, exotic effects. And, uh, and more, and more and more, we're going from sort of these effects to devices and re really sort of trying to address societal problems with this particular um, technology platform. But people in the last decade or so have demonstrated things like negative refraction, zero index materials, cloaking, giant nonlinearities, ultra thin super lenses and hologram devices. To just name a few, there's a large number of different uh, uh, groups working on metamaterials, metasurface applications, all the way from the UV to the millimeter microwave uh, regime. So a very, very rich field that uh, I'm only trying to sort of summarize it within uh, half a slide. Our um, interest in uh, metamaterials or metasurfaces uh, has always been to try and make adaptive devices, tunable devices, smart devices, switchable reconfigurable devices. There's a large number of different acronyms and different uh, things that people are calling these devices, but in effect, we're trying to understand how we can control in a very, very, um, uh, in, a, in an intricate way, um, and most, most importantly, in a non-volatile way, um, uh, the various, um, uh, these various nanophotonic devices that we're trying to create and integrate with telecom and computing um, platforms. So people have looked at a, a, lot, a number of different um, uh, stimuli to try and reconfigure metamaterials and metasurfaces. People have looked at things like thermal control, stretchable substrates, um, uh, magnetic control, micromechanical control, uh, and many, many other uh, other things. Uh, every every day, we've got a new demonstration of a particular new force being used. In most of these cases, though, as you can appreciate here, these are all volatile changes, right? So as soon as you stop stretching the substrate, as soon as you stop um, putting a temperature or a magnetic field in or some sort of electrostatic signal, your device will go back to its ground state. Um, so this is where our interest comes, right? We are trying to integrate phase change, um, the phase change mechanism within metal chalcogenides um, and use it as a non-volatile reconfiguration mechanism in metamaterials and metasurfaces. And we've done this over the last decade or so with um, in two main um, uh, with two main approaches, if you will. Um, uh, one approach is hybridizing our uh, phase change material with a plasmonic metasurface. So, for example, you'll see here the fact that uh, um, um, we we can create uh, resonances <clears throat> uh, from gold metasurfaces or silver metasurfaces, whatever plasmonic metal you're using. And by incorporating the phase chain charcoal layer in close proximity in the near field of these metasurfaces, and by changing the refractive index of this uh, phase change layer, we can change the resonance, uh, resonant position and the resonant properties of this particular gold metasurface. Uh, so if we add a particular resonance, you can shift it by changing the refractive index of the phase change layer. This shift will generally give you a red shift because the refractive index increases upon crystallization. And if you've got a high Q factor enough metasurface that you've designed, you can create very large uh, and enhanced optical contrasts in your signal um, at the wavelength that you've designed your original resonance at. <clears throat> so we can do this with the hybrid approach, uh, which is where we started out with. Um, but we can also do this through an all-chalcogenide approach. So instead of using plasmonics to create the resonance, we can create, use the high refractive index of these chalcogenized semiconductors themselves, these metal chalcogenized themselves, um, to hold a mold, to hold, to hold a, a resonance. So by using mean resonances in high index dielectric uh, uh, metal chalcogenides, you can create an all chalcogenide metasurface where the entire metasurface is a phase change uh, material. And you can again create the same sort of effects create resonances that you can shift back and forth. But instead of using plasmonics, you're using uh, the dielect high index dielectric properties of these Um And uh, this, again, uh, gives you a, a very nice uh, non-volatile um, uh, reconfiguration mechanism. And we've gone ahead and we've used these in a variety of different applications at different wavelengths uh, with different effects. 
So um, let me uh, cover a little bit for you uh, some of the devices we made in the near IR using the high index dielectric properties. So originally, as I said, we, we started off with the uh, hybrid approach where we use um, a gold meta surface and integrate it uh, with a, a chalcogenate phase change material. And by transitioning this uh, particular layer, um, we can create very high um, contrast ratios, amorphous to crystalline contrast ratios. And then we can shift from, say, the near infrared part of the spectrum to the mid IR part of the spectrum. And this was uh, back in 2013. At the time, I believe, was, was one of the or the thinnest uh, optical switch uh, with a non-volatile um, switching mechanism that was demonstrated at the time. Um, so this was the hybrid approach. Um, we've also... Uh, We've also um, gone ahead, as I said, and uh, transitioned over and demonstrated the whole uh, the thing in a, uh, the, the same sort of functionality in a all chalcogenide meta surface. Um, and you can see here that by um, creating nanograting meta surfaces here, or more recently, people are referring to these more as meta gratings. Um, um, we have we can create very nice uh, optical resonances that we can tune across um, uh, the telecom band by tuning the geometry of our um, uh, grating designs, and um, and by holding this um, dielectric me mode uh, within the grating itself rather than using the plasmonic properties of a gold metal surface, for example, uh, we can create uh, these very nice tunable resonances um, that that they can be then transition uh, through a phase change uh, from amorphous to crystalline um, um, uh, phase. And at the wavelength of operation, we can create very high uh, optical contrasts um, in reflection and transmission. In this particular case, we demonstrated five to one and one to three transmission ratios. Um, again, in a single layer GSD phase change meta surface um, that you can tune by, the, by changing the geometry of the device. Um, uh, so if we transition and talk a little bit about the visible part of the spectrum now and how we can use those that plasmonic dielectric transition um, that I mentioned to you, that's very unique in these materials, how can we make use of this? Um, we've made, there's a number of different ways you can make use of this, but we've made use of this in, in the case of solid state displays. So by um, creating meta surfaces where you, your, uh, your resonances uh, lie in the visible part of the spectrum where we can now start to play with color and re, um, uh, shall we say, rearranging the dispersion of, uh, of our phase change layer uh, or phase change uh, tri-layer in this case, um, to have a particular weighting on your visible spectrum that would give you different colors, right? We're now playing not just with resonances, but overall um, uh, color control. And you can see here that this is unstructured, a meta surface structured and a phase transition layer. Um, uh, and we can create a, a variety of different colors by changing, by nanostructuring these surfaces in the visible part of the spectrum. And by transitioning between a dielectric to a plasmonic state, we can tune the color of these met meta surfaces, um, uh, of these phase change pixels, if you will. Um, so we can move around. Here I show you the CIE color plot, a sort of universally recognized uh, way of quantifying color, the color spectrum. Um, and you can see that, for example, in, the, in this particular, I'm just showing one transition of a meta surface from amorphous to crystalline uh, regime. Uh, will give you the ability to move around this color spectrum, um, really in a very, very simple three-layer structure that has this non-volatile um, transition. So this is a, a great uh, sort of platform for reflective displays where you don't need to power them all the time and in a very flexible platform, right? Um, and, um, and the great thing is that you can make reflective transmitted, transmissive or absorptive displays because of the fact that we're using meta surface, it can all be controlled through geometry and through designing the meta molecule. So this is now using the plasmonic to dielectric transition in these meta surf and these materials and these metal chalcogenides. Um, uh, for um, specific applications. Now, let me just also touch upon this particular uh, demonstration that we did in 2016, um, where we used the multi-level switching capability of uh, these metal charcoal So far, what I've been telling you um, has always been an, a straight up amorphous to crystalline transition, right? Binary to uh, binary transition, amorphous crystalline, crystalline amorphous. What I haven't told you is that when you go down into the femtosecond regime, the picosecond regime, and depending on how you control your pulses, 
you can create multi-level switching regimes here, where here we've demonstrated in 2016 in this Nature Photonics paper that was uh, featured on the cover, um, almost 100 levels between a fully amorphous and a fully crystalline um, film. This is a tri-layer film again, uh, a GSD-225 film sandwiched between uh, two zinc sulfide silica capping layers just to protect it from the environment, from, um, from uh, contamination and other things. Um, and we, we take this particular multi-level switching uh, capability and we can then start to draw with a laser different devices on our phase change layer. Um, so if you think about it, in optics, we're dealing mostly with refractive index contrast. The, the reason why a metasurface uh, is made from uh, using EBL or FIV is we're removing materials to create a refractive index difference. Um, you can do the same thing if you have a large enough difference um, in your optical properties. So we, we tried to sort of understand and demonstrate this. And we, we came up with this, uh, what we call an optical canvas, where we can one day write with our uh, phase change beam uh, a metasurface. The next day we come in and we erase that and we write a lens. And the same device, one day is a filter, the next day is a lens, the next day can be a, a hologram and, and many, many other things. Um, um, so really, we can have optically rewritable devices, um, not reconfigurable, rewritable devices. Um, and in this context, we, we demonstrated things like grayscale holograms that you can write and erase. Um, so you can appreciate the fact that here the whiter areas are crystalline, the darker areas are amorphous. And because of this now multi-level switching regime, we can create grayscale crystallization and create all sorts of very um, intricate hologram um, uh, patterns in this case. We can create lenses on the same exact sample. Uh, another day, write two lenses, erase one, write it again, fully functional. We can take the same thing and erase that and write a metasurface the next day, erase that, right? So you've got really a, an optical etcher sketch. If any of you have, uh, have kids and you, you've seen these etcher sketches, this is basically what we're, what we're doing here with, these, uh, with this particular device. So um, just to sort of uh, wrap up this section, um, uh, given time constraints, of course, um, we've got a, um, a large number of different devices that we've demonstrated in, uh, in the infrared electro-optic regime and the UV side of things. We, um, what I didn't mention at all in this particular talk is that these materials go to very low refractive indices in the UV part of the spectrum. So this allows you to be able to um, create what we sort of uh, proximity resonances, if you will, in adjacent high index low loss materials, which we used in this now lattice paper in 2019 to create UV reconfigurable matter surfaces. Um, you can use them for thermal imaging, uh, uh, inducing optical um, activity. Hyperbolic matter surfaces, we've also demonstrated by integrating them within multi layer structures that are uh, akin to the hyperbolic matter material uh, community. And, uh, and as I said, I'm very happy to discuss these offline um, and just touch upon them for, for the purpose of sort of time constraint that we have. Um, I wanna sort of um, 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 end on two, two mini sections here um, uh, where, we, where I just wanna touch upon some of the integration that we've been doing. Um, so with all of these devices, now that we have a device platform, a free space device platform that can allow us to create signal changes, create signal intensity or phase changes, uh, optical phase changes um, um, uh, in our signal, um, we've been thinking about how we can integrate them with various telecommunication computing platforms. So we've got a huge amount of activity nowadays on integrating them with silicon photonics and optical fiber um, platforms. So I'll cover, um, in this particular um, uh, presentation, I'll cover the uh, optical fibers. Uh, silicon photonics is in itself a, a, a very large presentation. I'm happy to talk about those uh, if anyone's interested at another time. Um, so I just want to uh, tell you the motivator for why we're trying to put these into optical fibers and waveguides. So I showed you this particular permittivity curve beforehand. Um, let me just change that to the refractive index curve. So just the equivalent refractive index curve across the telecom band. And you can see that the refractive index change that we have in a crystalline, in a GSD, a material system, is on the order of more than two and a half in refractive index. That is a huge change in refractive index. Our signal can be modulated by huge modul modulation contrast. As, and to just put it in context with what's out there right now, what's currently being used, lithium niobate platforms have refractive index changes on the order of less than one. Uh, thermal optic effects in silicon are 
again, on the order of less than one. These are the most widely used modulation mechanisms in, in uh, waveguide and optical fiber-based platforms. So in the case of charcogenized and phase chain charcogenized, metal charcogenized, we can have much larger uh, refractive index changes. And most importantly, they're non-volatile reconfiguration mechanisms. So energy only needed for switching, not for maintaining the device. So we've been uh, looking at how to integrate them with various things. Fiber integration is what I'm going to cover here. Um, and the other motivator in particular for the fibers has been the fact that um, currently in a, in a typical telecom data center, you've got these sort of tra um, various electro-optic modules um, that will do the data processing for you, while the optical fiber is generally treated as a much more passive um, uh, platform, where you take the signal from one end to the other. Um, we've been thinking, how can we create a monolithic system here where we don't have to keep the engineer doesn't have to keep taking the optical fibers, connecting them to the, the devices back and forth and creating alignment issues, creating all sorts of other um, um, uh, data latency problems and other things. Uh, and the fact that we have to convert our optical signal every time to electrical signal, process it on the chip, convert it back and then send it down the fiber again. So how can we try to create a monolithic system that allows permanent alignment, alignment and seamless integration with fiber optic platforms? And we believe that one possible solution is integrating these meta surfaces, phase chain meta surfaces within, within optical fibers, either on the tip of these optical fibers or on the side of optical fibers. Um, so this is uh, one example of, uh, of uh, uh, a GST meta surface that we've integrated on our commercial single mode SMF28 fiber, the same stuff that's being used in your broadband. Um, this is an SCM picture of the meta surface. In this case, we've chosen a cuboid meta surface. We can create resonances across the entire telecom band, excuse me, the entire telecom band, switch them on and off by uh, creating phase transitions. And this was actually just published in Advanced Optical Materials. It's uh, featured on the cover of this very week, I believe, and also covered in Major Photonics recently. Um, so in the case of tip integrated optical fibers, you have to create a me mechanical splicing regime, right? Because you have the metal surface on the tip, you cannot just integrate it um, in a traditional fusion splicing technique. Um, so you have to use these sort of mechanical splicing commercially available um, um, uh, 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 ferrules um, to create a fully encapsulated devices. And uh, we can also, as a, um, through this phase transition, not just make signal intensity changes, but also create group delay dispersion changes and various other changes that in phase and uh, intensity that as you as you desire for your particular application and so to to, to also mitigate and also sort of uh, Perhaps many, some applications may not um, um, uh, want this particular mechanical splicing technique. So we've also looked at um, side polished fiber integration of these um, um, uh, materials and metal surfaces, where we polish a particular optical fiber. Again, it's an SMF28 uh, standard commercial fiber. We're always looking at trying to, this is the whole aim of this is to bridge the gap to industry, right? Bridge the gap to integration. Um, and by creating by uh, creating this nice polished surface close to the core and controlling the distance between the surface and the core and the thickness of this high refractive index phase change metal charcoal layer, we can create very nice resonances that we can control the interaction with. So control the Q of Q factor or the modulation depth, whichever you want to call it, um, by controlling this D, the distance between the uh, the core and the film. Um, and also by controlling the thickness of the film, we can tune the spectral position of this resonance from a 1270 here, uh, we're just demonstrating all the way across 1630. So across all, all the way back to the L band of the, of the uh, telecommunication um, uh, spectrum. Um, and you can nanostructure them um, uh, to create multiple resonances, so multi-resonant devices where we have a thin film resonance and a metasurface resonance that we can play with through geometry and through phase. Uh, phase transitions and this interplay allows us to be able to uh, really create a, a, a large number of different interesting sort of uh, pump probe devices um, and this is an area we're pursuing quite aggressively as well right now. Um, so the last thing I want to mention is this uh, um, uh, is there life beyond phase change? So I've been talking uh, about phase change for a number of years now and I, I, I believe that the community is listening and the people are are really uh, looking into uh, phase transition but it's 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 nice to also have a mind on what's what 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 it can we find any other interesting effects that may give us similar uh, functionality but perhaps may also give us some sort of gain um, 
the major bottleneck, the major issue that may um, that can affect face chain devices is long term endurance. We can switch these millions and millions of times, um, but there is a clear difference in terms of um, uh, the uh, uh, requirements that one has as a memory, as a uh, telecommunication, as a memory a data storage device, than as a modulator, than as something that has to switch by 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18 times. So it, there's a large number of, uh, large part of the community now starting to think about how can we mitigate against, how can we create a phase change material or phase change device that has universal endurance? So it can be switched basically universally without failing ever. Um, and some people are looking at different interlayers and different structuring, different alloys, different compositions. And we're also doing that as well. But also it's, it, it's, it's useful for us to take a look at what other effects are out there in these metal charcoal nuts, um, which may not need this melt quench mechanism that's inherent in phase change. So we've been looking at a large number of different effects. This is a, a particular list of uh, charcoal and functionality library um, that I've, I've dragged out of this uh, beautiful paper from Professor in 2016, 2006. And first of all, this firstly demonstrates what a playground charcoal drawings are, metal charcoal drawings are, in terms of uh, uh, as a research topic for, uh, for a scientist. Uh, this is a, about 20 lifetimes worth of research you can do here. Um, but in particular, what's been fascinating to us is this photo dissolution and photo doping effect, um, where um, you can dope amorphous charcoalites, metal char uh, with metals, particular metals, in particular silver. And by putting different uh, uh, sort of uh, levels of light, uh, band gap light and non-band gap light onto them, you can move the, uh, these metal ions that you've doped into the uh, charcoal night itself. And this is a large number of different effects have been identified over the last couple of decades, generally bulk charcoal, things like photodoping, photochemical modification, photo-induced surface deposition, and many other things. Um, so people have looked at these, but not really taken much attention to them. Um, we've been looking at them in the context of nanophotonics recently, and we've demonstrated uh, recently that you can switch these electrically. As you can see here, we've got a, 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 a doped metal charcoalite film with two electrodes around it. And by putting electricity around this particular layer, we can switch, move these ions within this layer. You can see the tsunami of ions moving between the two electrodes as we change the polarity of our signal. You can do this optically by putting band gap light onto the film. You can do this with an electron beam, so you can even use it as for electron beam exist if you wish. Um, so this is a very interesting mechanism, non-volatile mechanism that does not require a melt quench process. And this is something that we've been looking at recently as an alternative mechanism, and it was just published in 2020 in Advanced Optical Materials, also chosen as one of the covers in an upcoming issue. And um, we demonstrated that we can switch these back and forth, and um, we can see the fact that we can move around sort of aggregates of silver uh, uh, around this uh, uh, this host metal chalcogenide uh, and uh, dissolve and sort of aggregate them. Um, and create sort of refractive indices changes on the order of 0.2 in this particular case. And this is an unoptimized composition um, that um, it's an unoptimized composition that once we sort of we're going through stoichiometric engineering, I think we can really identify very, very interesting alloys with very low losses in this particular uh, round. So with that, I'm just going to quickly just uh, run through some of the facilities that we have available in case anyone's interested in getting in touch with us for collaborations. Um, we've established the Alberta Metal Charcoal Manufacturing Facility in, in Edmonton here. Um, we, uh, we routinely uh, sputter and evaporate a large number of metal charcoal um, uh, Anything, uh, almost all the phase change alloys that are being used anywhere uh, currently, where we're dealing, where, uh, we have active projects on and we're depositing routinely. We believe we have the largest selection of phase change materials being uh, sort of with the deposition capability globally currently. So if anyone's interested in sort of integrating phase change materials and metal charcoal uh, get in touch with us. Um, we have a lot of different facilities for actually creating alloys and targets that are not available commercially. So if you're interested in an alloy that's not available commercially, we have the capabilities to start with powders, purify them, test them, uh, sputtering targets that then we can sputter on our, our own system. So we have end-to-end -end control and the ability to introduce a large number of very strange alloys, as exotic alloys, and uh, put together the processing around that. This is all within um, my own lab, the nanoscale optics. 
Um, we have the capability to measure all of these metasurfaces, electro-optically, all optically, um, across temperature from a low vacuum to 600 degrees with various uh, atmospheres, on fibers, um, uh, on waveguides, and also uh, within environmental chambers. Um, and we can simulate ob ob obviously all of these different uh, uh, devices, um, dope them with nanoparticles, uh, and probe them. Um, uh, this is our side polished fiber setup. Um, and again, just a quick plug for Edmonton Nano. We have a large nanofab here outside of my own lab's uh, capability that's uh, available to us and uh, available to everyone in Canada. So if you're interested in uh, uh, creating these sort of uh, highly scaled nano photonic devices, uh, the U of A's nanofab is, is extremely well um, uh, suited for this. And with that, I'll just uh, thank my team, and these are the geniuses doing the work, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and really, uh, uh, this is the dream team that's uh, bringing you all of these interesting uh, concepts, and they're working on a variety of interesting things going forward as well. And with that, I will end um, uh, the, the talk and just uh, uh, summarize and tell you, the, just remind you that reconfigurable metal material devices based on metal charcoal and semiconductors, uh, um, uh, which have these wonderful phase change uh, functionalities, um, are a hugely promising platform for a large number of different emerging telecommunication, optical computing, display and uh, display and sort of uh, um, uh, sensing also applications. Um, I, I, I told you about the fact that we can really stoichiometrically um, tune and uh, uh, sort of. Uh, 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 create these designer materials with designer optical properties for your specific application. We can uh, create a lot of different devices from UV all the way across the telecom band with them using the, the dielectric properties or their plasmonic properties or a hybridization of them. It can integrate them on fibers and uh, and other things. And there's also a large number of different other effects outside of the immediate phase change uh, effect that uh, really is worth exploring going forward uh, as we try to uh, really have a go at integrating them within uh, robust computing and telecommunication applications and devices, which need, in effect, universal endurance. Um, so with that, I'll thank you all for listening, and uh, I'll end it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kulipar. Um, with that, uh, we'll uh, turn over questions to the audience. I'll try to prioritize uh, any grad students that are out there, but uh, everyone is uh, welcome uh, to starting to ask some questions. Um, I'll start with uh, Emmett there. Hi, thank you for, uh, for such a great presentation. Um, I find these optical induced phase transitions to be very fascinating. And I was wondering if so you're, you're inducing this phase transition that's changing the optical properties of the material as well, as well, if I understand. Um, do you ever have to take any precautions to make sure that that phase, transi phase transition actually is reversible? Oh, very good question, actually. Um, so you, you may have noticed the fact that um, in, the, uh, in the demonstration of nature photonics, for example, and the one with the display, we had two layers around our phase change layer, and also um, in, the, in the one in the MPGA material. So we generally um, uh, cap uh, the, the material system. So when you melt and quench it, in that molten state, um, you, you are open to um, uh, contamination from the environment if, this, if it's not capped, right? So in a molten state, you, you might uh, oxidize, uh, you will oxidize, and you will degrade your device over time. So we generally create um, uh, capping layers on our devices, and we also separate them out by only a couple of nanometers um, uh, from uh, low melting point metals. So one of the sort of considerations you should make if you're trying to sort of integrate them with, with um, um, uh, metals is that metals at thin thicknesses um, degrade in their melting point. So the melting point that you had on the bulk is not the melting point that you have as a 20, 30 nanometer film or you know, that sort of very thin film. So if you're trying to transition, create this melt point process, you may go above the melt, melting point of that film of metal that's sitting in proximity, right? So you generally have to put sort of very thin layers in between those. And the consideration that you wanna make when you're trying to sort of put these together, and this is why we, have, we 
we generally run a huge number of simulations when we're trying to develop, you know, create a particular device. And it's all related to these sort of, um, this exact question is that as you put a, a, a buffer layer, for example, let's, let's take the hybrid device as, a, as an example, which we've moved off from, but it's still um, quite actively being used by a large number of different groups I've seen around the world. People are still looking at the hybrid system uh, where they combine the metal and the, and the chalcogenide. Metal is the resonator, chalcogenide is the phase transition layer. Um, when you put this layer in between, you're effectively decoupling your, your, your two layers from each other, right? You're creating a distance where the mode overlap is decreased. Um, so with a increase in robustness in those uh, platforms, you will also get a decrease in modulation contrast. Now the modulation contrast is so, so much higher than anything that thermal optic effects or, or sort of lithium niobit is giving you that you can afford to lose some. Um, um, and still be able to sort of create a similar device in terms of contrast, but with a non-volatile um, um, caveat to that. Um, so yeah, so it, when you're, when, it's a very good question. When you're trying to sort of put, you do want to put these layers in, and when you do put these layers in, you should run very, very um, detailed thermal optic simulations to understand how the whole th temperature distribution as well as the optical mode overlaps change. Great, thank you. No. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, please. Yeah, very, very interesting talk. Um, I didn't quite catch, maybe I just missed this, is what is the time scale for the two transitions between phases typically for the devices? Very good question. Um, so uh, the typical um, uh, full transition, if you're going for a full transition, um, we're, we're, we're dealing with nanoseconds at the moment, okay? Um, but a full transition is a two and a half N. Um, so you don't need that much. Um, so as you saw in the nature photonic example that I showed, uh, we used 85 femtosecond pulses um, and we managed to get 100 levels, not very clearly noticeable on an optical microscope. Um, uh, so if you're, if you're thinking about trying to create the same sort of refractive index changes as silicon, we're dealing with picosecond uh, transitions because you're not going for a full uh, two and a half end change. But, but that's the transition from crystalline to amorphous, right? So amorphous to, so uh, again, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll make that distinction. That's, uh, so the amorphous to crystalline transition is a longer transition um, than the crystalline to amorphous transition. So when we're trying to melt and quench this device back from the crystalline back to the amorphous, right. the really the, the main thing that we want to uh, control is that quench rate, right? So we want to control the tail end of our pulse and we want to be able to bring it down very quickly. So typically the transitions in the crystalline to amorphous are shorter. The amorphous to crystalline is longer. Um, uh, but yeah, in, 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 in both of these cases, we're dealing with nanosecond and below that. Now, there's one other thing that I just want to mention here is that there are a large number of different groups coming, um, working on various protocols to switch these devices. So as an example of that, I'm just going to refer you to, for example, I, you may be aware of this already, but there was a paper, for example, from Stephen Elliott's group in Cambridge a number of years ago in science called Breaking the Speed Limit of Phase Change Memory, where they put a, a little electrical pulse on their cell um, that's constantly there, and they call this a priming pulse. And they switch on top of that. And this allows them to create a much faster transition uh, because the sort of nucleation before the growth regime kicks in is already in place. Um, so when, when we sort of talk about these things, uh, we, we, we have to be careful that when we give numbers, these are sort of very, very sort of vague numbers. And depending on the device and the protocol, you can really tune this nanoseconds to below. Okay, thanks, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Miriam, please. Hey, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, actually, I have a question regarding uh, how much time they can keep their crystal structure. For example, imagine that they are in, um, they, you have applied, for example, light and they have created uh, their crystalline structure. How much time they can keep their structure? So this is a non-volatile effect. They will keep it until you come back and you switch it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is not the sort of effect like silicon thermal optic, which is going to come back down to ground level or sort of these other volatile effects. You've created a permanent change in your crystal structure. Um, it will stay there until you come in and sort of melt, quench it, or anneal it to the other phase. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I'm talking about, uh, for example, a big number, for example, phase change material. Um, I have, for example, 
500, they can keep their crystal structure for 500 hours. And um, uh, I'm, I'm talking about uh, so, uh, your, your, this number. So this, this I, I don't know about this number that you're referring to. So phase change materials in the context of metal child cosmonite phase change devices, mm -hmm. these are non-volatile permanent changes that we make. We, mm -hmm. we switch the crystal. There's no, there's no, as you, so you've done this already yourself. You've recorded a CD or a DVD, right? Mm -hmm. Written mm -hmm. a CD, DVD, Blu-ray. You, you, mm -hmm. You've come back after days or months and the data is still there. Yes, yes, there sure. Go. That's your answer, then, right? That's the answer. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're dealing with the same exact mechanism here. So this non-volatile, I'm, I'm not quite sure about the 5,000 hour thing that uh, you're referring to. Um, that may be with a particular alloy, but in the case of metal chalcogenite phase chain devices, these are uh, sort of non-volatile changes that we make. Because now, I know, I should, yes. sorry, sorry. No, Karen. Uh, because I know that, for example, for um, GSBT phase change material, it's about, I think, maybe one month or 25 days, 27 days, something like this. Uh, that's why um, I, I Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure at all where these numbers are. I, I, mm -hmm. I, you can't send me these numbers because these mm -hmm. are absolutely new information to me. Um, mm -hmm. So um, IBM, Intel, Samsung have already integrated mm -hmm. these things mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. devices. They, 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 um, they are non-volatile and in our own devices, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we do not see a change across a couple of hours. I can, I can confidently say about our devices, we see no change across uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours, days, months, um, until you come and change it. Now, there is a drift and a diffusion issue, which you may be, you may be referring to this, if, if that may be something that... So when you're transitioning between amorphous and crystalline over and over again, millions and millions of times, okay, mm -hmm. you're not, you're rearranging your atomic structure constantly, right? So when, the, when you are, let's say you're in amorphous phase now, you crystallize, and then you crystallize, you amorphize back. This amorphous phase is never going to be exactly the same as this amorphous phase. Because mm -hmm. you have the stochasticity of your atoms moving around. The atoms are all, not always going to sit and stick in the same positions from run to run, right? So mm -hmm. you're going to get slight changes in your um, optical signal or in your electrical signal and the and sort of um, drift or sort of uh, noise that we call in our sort of electrical devices. Um, and this comes from the fact that these things are moving and not always sitting in the same place. But this doesn't affect in any way the non-volatility. It affects how many times we can switch it. So at the moment, I believe that the record is what, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, a little bit higher than that. Um, but um, in every case between the two phases, you stay in that phase. You're not drifting out of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And, and what is the dimension of the material that you have fabricated? I, uh... The, the so, total dimension, I mean. Uh, so this, the, the total dimensions that we aim for are based on our own experimental setups. Um, so you can you can obviously create uh, any large size that you need. We, we aim for 25, 30 micrometers in lateral size. Each of our metamolecules will be um, on the order of a couple of hundred nanometers or less, uh, which is governed by the wavelength of operation for our device. So the, the um, uh, metamolecule sizes was much smaller in the case of the color um, uh, devices where we're dealing with the visible part of spectrum and the mm -hmm. larger when we're dealing with the telecom band. Um, uh, so a couple of hundred nan nanometers in the uh, metamolecule size, but the overall lateral dimension of our metasurfaces, typically 25 to 30 micron, but that's because we, our experimental setups in, our, in my lab, have they've all been homogenized as to, to sort of be able to um, go from fab to characterization and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions uh, at the moment, uh, but we are going a bit late. So what I'm going to do is uh, just uh, let's everybody thank Dr. Gulipur again. And if anybody wants to stick around, if you have some time, would you have uh, some time to stick around if some enterprising grad student has a, another question? Sure. Sure. I'll, I'll stick around for a couple minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so we can uh, release the, the general audience. Uh, thank you all for coming out. And uh, if you want to ask some specific questions, uh, again, uh, pseudo offline, uh, please stick around. <laughs>